seed and her fruits. You can fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We can defend our army. Never let us fail. January 28, 2008, and I'm at Stansted Airport in England. I'm here because my favorite band, Iron Maiden, has invited us to film the first leg of their Somewhere Back in Time world tour. This tour is based on the classic World Slavery Tour from 1985, which is back when I first became a fan. That's a thing of beauty. Over the next six weeks, we'll travel 40,000 miles on Iron Maiden's private 757, Ed Force One and watch them play 21 cities in 12 countries across four continents. That's an average distance of 2,000 miles between each show. And what's even more impressive is that lead singer Bruce Dickinson is flying the plane. The airplane idea started off as a crazy gleam in my eye. And I went, wow, if you could get all your gear into an airplane, you could cut down hugely on the amount of dead space we have in touring. So I said, what happens if you just join up all the countries that, that accountants say, you can't go there, it costs too much. <laughs> and we just join them up and we go, bum, 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 bum. Yes, we can, because we've got our own magic carpet. The idea of specially modifying a plane to take the band, 70 crew, and over 12 tons of equipment has never been attempted before. This could be the most ambitious tour in rock history and everyone seems a little nervous to see if they can pull it off. So when you're going around the world and you're trying to combine passenger and freight on the same plane, it's on that level, it's very, very hard. And we knew what we had to do. We had to get the engineers involved to make sure the plane could stand that stress of flying with that much freight in the back. And to get that, all of that together took a year. Everything else was in place. We'd got the visas, we'd got the equipment, we'd got everything. The only thing we hadn't got was the authorization to fly the plane. Mm. I, was, I was the nut in the nutcracker, as it were, because when it came to that morning and we still hadn't signed off on the bits of paper we needed to get the airplane airborne, I was, um, I was in a stressful place. The tire was a little bit flat this morning, not dangerously so, but just as a precaution, we put a new wheel on it. It's not my Formula One. 
Right, young man who brought the wine, is that him? Yeah. Front and centre, take your hands out your pocket. How come we shouldn't have our hands in our pockets? Because it shows a slovenly attitude, the type of attitude that is easily displayed by ex-colonialists like you lot. <laughs> Ian, what are you going to tell me to do with the documentary people if they annoy me? You said I've got to be really nice to you. Iron Maiden's always been a band that's maintained their privacy to a certain level over the years. They've never really had like a camera crew kind of come into their lives who are outsiders, and we don't really know what to expect. Well, good morning. Hey, Welcome good to morning. Stansted. <laughs> Who's you? Who's you? Who are you? Because as we drove into the airport, everybody had arrived. There were you guys out there with the cameras, and uh, Rob was telling us to be nice to you and all this. And I was like, yeah, you like camera out of my face. <laughs> I didn't really sleep a lot the night before. It was, you know, it's like going on holiday when you get, you know, when you were a kid and get anxious and don't want to go to bed, just want to go away. Oh yes, here we go, Ed Force One. Hey. You freaking beauty! I must admit, I was a bit sceptical about it all. The idea of band and crew travelling on the same plane was like a trip you do away in a coach somewhere and have a few cans of beer in the back, you know, like a day trip, except that he lasted six weeks. <laughs> I think the only time we'd ever travel with a crew was back in the late 70s, where basically there was only one crew member. <laughs> there was all a band and one guy. I think it's something everyone looked forward to, actually, because I mean, all crews are maniacs, and ours has got their share of characters. No interviews, tax purposes. No, you're not allowed in this section, I'm sorry, you haven't got a special oh, pass. Of <laughs> so we got the rubber stamp yeah, approval. All, you know, we're all strapped down and palleted and firebagged and everything else. And we're good to go. Good to go. Everything was just going swimmingly. And I sat in the flight deck going, there were so many things that could go wrong. Just, just take a deep breath and wait till they close all the holds and then we can go. Four hours 45 is the flying time. A bit windy when we get to Baku and then a stonking tailwind take us to Mumbai. Three hours 47 to Mumbai. Plenty of time to drink the coast bottles of wine. Uh, see you later and we'll get ourselves underway. All right? Bye for now. I start triple six tower, five Sierra one, clear for takeoff, wind two nine zero ten knots. Five Sierra one, clear takeoff, five Sierra one, clear takeoff, five Sierra one. I've done plenty of takeoffs in Boeing 757s, but this particular one was rather special. You know, it was like, I was so glad to get the wheels up and get underway. Everybody was just chuffed to bits in the aeroplane. You know, the seats were all comfy and the road crew couldn't believe the leg room and then the cabin crew started serving the drinks and the grub and everything else. Everybody was like, yeah, great. This is the way to do it. <laughs> Thursday, the band's been mobbed by young rock fans, keen to get a closer look at their heroes. Although Iron Maiden struggle to get any radio airplay back home, they still fill stadiums around the world. This new plane means they can play more shows in more countries than any other group can. Despite being around for decades, Iron Maiden are spearheading a new wave of hard rock here in India. Teenagers fed up with mass market Bollywood music are buying into heavy metal in a big way. Matt Smith, Sky News, Mumbai. Are you happy? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even funny, man. <laughs> this tour really, for us, it's a, a retrospective look at a, a really classic period in the band's history. And that we're playing songs we haven't played in 23 years. But most importantly, for an audience which has 
never seen us perform these songs. This is a real treat. You know, it's, it's every guy's dream to be a rock star, and you guys are living that dream. So can you give us a little insight about, you know, what it's really like backstage on tour? You know, the kind of stuff that you wouldn't want us to know. <laughs> if we told you, then you'd know, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, we could tell you, but we'd have to kill you. <laughs> So how did you first discover Iron Maiden? Discovered at my friend's uncle's place and I saw this uh, seven son of a seven son cassette box over there and uh, I just freaked out on the artwork to be honest. It was just love at first listen. I, I just got moved on to Maiden just, just like that. Right. And uh, you know, I haven't uh, looked behind ever since. The first time we played in India was in Bangalore, and we were absolutely knocked sideways by the reaction. It was a 20,000-seat outdoor venue, and there were 50,000 people wanting to get in. It was reminiscent, in fact, of 1984, when we played behind the Iron Curtain for the first time, and we were besieged. This is the first major metal band which has played in India. I mean, they're larger than life, and you can see the crowd. They're waiting here from 6 o'clock in the morning, and it's very important because more and more kids get inspired by the metal scene. They start getting into playing guitar, drums, and forming bands, and something positive will come out of it in years to come. Bruce, you rock! Best band in the world, always will be. Up the irons. <laughs> The first show was India. What was your feelings going into it? Well, that? to be totally frank and honest with you, I was more frightened of getting up on that stage than I was getting inside of 757 with a bunch of hooligans and all our gear in the back. So we got to the venue and the stage was built from wood. The stage was sort of lashed together bamboo. We were sort of going around tested it but it was actually really solid the whole backstage thing where everything like red carpets and great big tents and you know it's almost like being back in the raj or something
conditioning off, please. Oh, oh. Let's go. Come on. Go. I'll tell you what, what amazed me was madness. Went down a storm. I know, I know. Which is unusual. Yeah. So, beer, 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 beer. 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 Oh, obviously got a very good taste in there, isn't it? Stuff I don't know. I don't know. Beer. Beer. Five beers is not enough for an hour journey, I appreciate it. <laughs> right, tour manager. Five beers to five people for an hour journey isn't enough. It's pathetic. I'm sure we can afford it. I can't talk very well, so my mouth's so dry. So bear with me. Dear boys and girls, this is what it's like after a gig in a van. If we post mortem the gig for about 10 seconds, make apologies to one another, unless there's a real big whoopsie. And then we argue about, and then we argue about ice, ice cream vans. Yeah. It was a little jagged tonight. Got and through it, I thought I might collapse our way through. I'm kind of run out of steam a bit. I'm an old man for crying out. Oh dear, we still got the police escort. We didn't need an escort. We yeah, don't want to fuck it up. Come on. is the best rock and roll manager in the world who is not just about the money and the fame and the bullshit. It's about integrity and we did it our way. He's just such a bombastic guy. I mean, which is what you want as a manager. Sometimes he, he, he's bombastic with us as well, which we don't really want at times. We all moan about him, but we love him dearly. And, and he's a very hard-edged person. He's, he's a Yorkshireman. Oh, bloody talk about that. Oh, bloody, oh come here. Oh, bloody Roderick Smallwood. He's brilliant when he bursts into the room. I thought that was him. <laughs> and it's a week, we've woken it up. Fat chat to sleep in. <laughs> some drinks and uh, just enjoy the atmosphere because we're all pumped for Maiden, we're all pumped, we are seriously uh, pumped. David from Melbourne, mate, a real fucking Maiden fan. It's not so much about identity or whatever social culture you think you fit into. You can see all these different types of people that come along to gigs and worship upon the altar that is Iron Maiden. They have this ability to really hit, hit your heart and either that or it just makes you fucking want to head bang and go fucking how long have you been Maiden fans? Since I was fucking born, man! <laughs> fucking day 666! Six, six, six. 
It's been 15 years since we've played Australia. I mean, everywhere we go, the, the fans are just so keen to have us back. You know, some people never see this, some people saw us, you know, on earlier tours, but absolutely incredible everywhere. It's, it's sort of bigger than ever. I mean, our heyday was the mid-80s, which is what this tour is all about. You know, we're 24, 25 years old now, but to get up on stage, and I look out, and I see the kids, and they haven't aged. You know, and it's really weird. I go, God, blimey, look, they're all the same kids that were out that front of the stage 20 odd years ago. So, what I'm trying to understand is why is it that Maiden appeals to mum and dad and all the kids? Because they're, good. they're fucking awesome, man. Like, come on. I believe Iron Maiden are playing here tonight. Giddy the fuck up. Steve's probably been flat out in bed. Oh, he's, he's also down still. Oh, Steve's down big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's looking really ill. We've all got picked up a little book from uh, India. Steve and I, probably more so. I mean, we got to the point where we didn't eat for four days. By the time we arrived in Australia and we turned up at the sound check, it was like we'd go to start a song and someone would be off to the bathroom. Like, all right, come back, and then you start, and it, it was just people were just off everywhere. I mean, we're all pretty jet lagged still. That, that jet lag is a killer, and you've got to have that adrenaline ready for that concert because those kids have paid the money and they want a good show. We've had buckets for both ends on stage during some of the shows. Ten out of ten to the band for putting up with that pressure putting up with that illness and going out on stage with, with those conditions. You know? There's always a shit house that you can sing in somewhere. Bit better. A bit better is better than worse. You know, none of the places you play are designed for music, so you always have sound problems. It's just something you have to overcome. You have to uh, just be prepared for the worst, you know, and if it sounds great, um, all the better, but you can't let it throw you off. You know, people that come pay to see you, they don't give a shit if, you know, if it doesn't sound good on stage or anything, they, they want to have a good time, and that's what you've got to try and put across. Adrian has always been the stickler for getting the tones right that he wants. He's very meticulous. He's like that in his playing. When you listen to his guitar solos, they're very meticulous, very precise. Adrian's guitar playing is the stitching. It's the texture, the fabric that covers all the structures. Nothing Adrian does is aggressive, like everything lopes. He picks notes out of the air like that. And how he does it, no one knows, only Adrian, because nobody else can do it. Uh, I'm trying to be all serious, I'll probably look... <laughs> Sorry. I've oh, felt like shit before I went on, and then I just... I 
I don't know, I've got some drilling going, I, I enjoyed it in it. Mm. Good. Contrary to belief, boys and girls, Harry Harris don't smack the shit out of his bass guitar string. He tickles them. Natural. I have it on good authority, he's a good tickler. Mm. Yeah, I've talked like a lot of bollocks, isn't he, eh? Seriously good authority. All shit comes out your mouth and your eyes, mate. Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Are you coming for a drink, Steve? Oh, I've got some nice there. chilli. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. just, just made for there. Oh, mate. Oh, you're, you're fired. You can go on. <laughs> Dude, I thought he was going to come and film me in the bloody bath. <laughs> I have my limits. <laughs> bloody right, you're doing, mate. <laughs> come on, bugger off, you. Cheers, boys. See you later, mate. I'll see you in the spring. I'll see you in the... Yeah, can't beat him. Bugger off. I don't like being part of the group all the time. You know, you need to be out, be an individual. It keeps you fresh. So when you got the show the next day, you're not all, you know, hungover or whatever. <laughs> I reckon I've known the guys for uh, 25 years. Their first tour here in Australia, Number of the Beast. And we um, went and met the guys and, and played tennis with them. And uh, we've been, uh, well, friends ever since, really. This is not easy. Fight. Again. So, is Adrian a worthy uh, opponent there, Pat? He's a much better tennis player than I am a guitarist. Not only did we get a chance to play with Pat Cash, we had also Wayne Arthurs. I think he had the fastest serve record for a while. I had the audacity to try and return one of his serve. <laughs> I was put firmly in my place and, you know. That's in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, little right, didn't you? Let <laughs> me get your camera. Ooh. You know, when you're on the road as much as we are, you just don't want to sit in your hotel room and just mope or watch movies. Everyone has their own activities that they do. I think it keeps you kind of sane. Get the, get the bloody way! <laughs> get out the bloody line! A lot of bands go out there and tend to put on this image of staying up all night, partying, and you can't go out and go crazy every night because the performance for the next show would suffer. Instead of spending six hours in the bar, you can spend six hours on the golf course, you know, and then maybe maybe an hour in the bar. <laughs> Not bad, Dave. Bit of hanging on the right side there. Kind um, of hurt. <laughs> Davey is the backbone of the band. You can have a chat about things and he won't say anything, and then he comes out with these amazing words of wisdom. Dave is the wise counsel. Doesn't say much. Day-to-day -day problems, not bothered. Major crises, somebody will ask Dave what he thinks. Well, I think this, and it's like, phew, oh, then we should have got that out of him two hours ago, you know. <laughs> and it's good night from him. And it's good night from him. And it's adios, amigos. Good luck. <laughs> bye <laughs> bye, boys and girls. <laughs> all of all the going on. How many you got to sign there? This is the second box load, and there's about another four box loads in the back that I ain't done yet. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of musicians that tour the world that won't bring their kids along, but uh, obviously it's very important to you to have them with you. I was the first one really to start taking my kids on the road, and, and I think that's really been the hardest part of touring, is being away from your family, you know. They've always enjoyed being on, on the road, and they still talk about, you know, oh, Dad, when we, can we go back and we'd go on a bus again? Yeah, we used to have our own bus. We were, like, separate from all the mayhem. Yeah. When we were younger. I used to like sleeping on the tour bus actually rather than being in hotels. How would you describe your dad to other people? Quiet. Really quiet. quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Shy. 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 Picks himself to himself. Yeah. Quite private. I think he's made, he's kept us really grounded. Because we could have just been a nightmare. So is this the last tour you're gonna do? Yes. Are you sure about that? Positive. Well, what do you plan to do with your time off? Grow vegetables. <laughs> I'll miss two things, abusing people and the sense of humour on the road. Put your bed to the lantern on water, remove your jacket from the container, pull it over your head, pull the tapes around your waist and tie them securely. Do you have a double knot on the left hand side? <laughs>
flying thing was something that was in my bones from when I was little. Two members of my family were in the RAF, so I was brought up with aeroplanes. It shocked me, the experience of getting in an aeroplane and actually flying. You can never be the master of it. You can control it to an extent, but eventually you have to submit to some of its realities. It's a very humbling experience. Bruce is just full on. I mean, he's the energy of the man. I mean, I just wish, I wish I had a serum and get something out of him sticking into me. He tends to be able to juggle lots of things at once. He has a perpetual flood of ideas. His enthusiasm rubs off. When he gets excited about something, he really follows it through. I mean, like now, he's flying planes on days off and we'd be like doing a European tour and we'd fly home after the show. I and mean, he'd be up next day flying to North Africa. You know, he's been cross at his age, he should slow down a bit, but... No, not, not a bit of it. It's past our second equal time point, so now we're absolutely committed to go to uh, Narita. This is, in fact, my first time flying into Japan. Plus, it's a very, very wonderful experience so far. back to the first time you played in Japan. I was very excited to come to Japan because it's somewhere I'd always wanted to visit. You know, I was rather intrigued with all the Shogun stuff. And that's why he's up all. Notice, I got a Yakuza Samurai on my side. See, look, see. Back then, you'd turn up at a hotel and they'd be there and they'd be giving you presents, little stuff, toys and little cards, and they just make you feel really welcome. I think it was the only place in the world where we we physically got mobbed by a teenage girl. Hello, my name is Maria, Japanese maiden girl, number one. Welcome to Japan, I am Maria, okay? I would like to become Steve Hai's daughter. <laughs> we'll have to work on that. Stay heavy. <laughs> Iron Maiden is having a massive resurgence. Is that what's happening in Japan? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying the whole world is like that. But when you debut from the beginning, it's a completely spiritual part. 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 There's no such a band. That's of course. How does it happen? Respect is made up of respect. It's a completely spiritual part. But it's nice, isn't it? You work your ass off. There are no days off. You are on 24-7. On a good day, I start at 7 and I finish at 2 a.m. The crew are the biggest partiers I know, but they always come in and do their gig. When you're in the Iron Maiden family, you're in the Iron Maiden family. You really got to screw up to get kicked out. Bell, how many times we could get a drink in before we finish building the set, please, mate? No. The guys are really thirsty. You'll wait. Just a couple of buckets. You'll wait. Please, Bill. You'll wait. He's a slave driver. <laughs> <laughs> Two Laurens and one support band. Chicken I'll send the old man back here to come get you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the old man of the sea. His last turn. It is, isn't it? Man. It is. It's his last go. It's his last go. How many times has he retired? He'll be back. This is about 40 times. At least twice. Times, least twice. <laughs> Dick Bell and I go back way before I joined the band. He's a phenomenal production manager. And he, he's part of the family. He used to come around and hit you on the arm. Like, come here. <clears throat> and he's, he's on a bit of a bastard. He knows exactly where to clump you. And, uh, now he's retiring again after tomorrow. Bruce, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get dressed yet. Okay, Dickie, we're looking at 10 minutes. Ashley, you good? I'm good, bro. Oh, I'm good. Hello.
from Japan after a couple of days there, up through Anchorage to LA. When we got to LA, Steve got straight off the plane. And then typically Steve, the music comes first, off the plane, bumps straight down the studio with Kevin. I don't think Maiden ever cares about being relevant. And I think that's one of the things that makes them relevant. We like eight minute songs, we like the slow intros and outros, we like the gallop in the middle. Guess what, it's, you know, so we've got 10 songs like that. We don't give a fuck. Steve is, you know, he's obviously the anchor of the band. He writes a lot of the songs. If he doesn't write the songs, he has a say in the way they get arranged. You know, it's Steve's band. We have this kind of sixth sense with one another. He doesn't have to say something, I can tell what he wants. And likewise, there are a handful of bass players that play our sort of music that are that good. And I happen to be playing with one I, I personally think is the best in the world. Steve is the musical basis of Maiden. And it's, it's something I can say quite often, all, all of the band would agree with that, that everything gets Steveized. The spirit of Maiden comes from his musical focus on what he thinks is right. And it's completely incorruptible. <laughs> Peace of mind. I mean, I wore that out. I'd, I'd, pl I'd listen to it all day, and then when it got to be nighttime, I'd put the headphones on, listen to it some more, you know, so I wouldn't keep keep the neighbors up. Did Smith and Murray influence your guitar playing in any Well, way? I was always a fan of the twin axe attack, but was uh, but uh, myself, I never you know wanted to share. <laughs> yeah, when, when Steve Harris's foot goes up on the monitor and he starts pointing this and starts singing along, I'm going to be very excited tonight. Let me say that right. <laughs> I remember. One thing that made quite an impact on me was on the number of the Beast tour at Long Beach Arena. We always, you know, Motai and Maiden for inspiration because they always had the cooler records, the cooler album covers, the cooler stage shows. They were just cooler than everybody else. Nico, is he an influence on you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's got such a great vibe. I mean, one day he's going to realize that if you got some smaller drums, you could actually see what he was doing. <laughs> he's kind of like, Nico, man, come on, man. I want to see what the fuck you're doing. I have an audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mr. Vinnie Apiche, I'm trying to learn something. is a human number. Its number is 666. <laughs>
going all the way around the time zones, halfway around the world, up to Japan, from summer to winter, not just across a date line, not just going backwards a day, but going back a whole season. That was a huge chunk of jet lag, just non-stop. But when we left LA, there was certainly, uh, I suppose it's slightly somber mood, because there was a feeling that, well, guys, I guess the holiday bit is over because the adventure was really about to begin. Because when we hit Latin America, you get this idea that you're on the edge of something exploding. Climb 50370, cleared direct to Tango Tango Mike, five star 666. 666 to You got it. south of the border, the hotter it fucking gets. And they 
was the two on the toughest areas, Manchester, Liverpool, we're all working class guys. And we have this kind of a credibility with the uh, fans, the connection, you know. Music meant a lot to people, obviously. It was a way out. It was a release. I think it's the same in Mexico. It's, it's almost like playing to a soccer crowd. They're singing, they're chanting all the words, and it's, it's a real tribal thing. Latin American audiences, you know they're going to be great. The anxiety is, are we going to be as good as the audience? Or are we just going to give 150%? We've really got to deliver a passionate performance that justifies our existence in front of this audience. That's ten dollars. No. All right, eight. That, that costs three hundred fifty dollars. Uh, You're joking. That's not worth three hundred. Yeah, look it's very nice. Money. I've seen work like that before for a fiver. That is my, that's beautiful. That's thank you so much. That's lovely. Look at that, boys and girls. Look at this. This is going to look great on my mantelpiece at home next to the other one I got last time I was here. <laughs> We've lost Yannick. Now, as you may have gathered from the uh, what you've seen so far, that Yannick's a little bit of a, a lone soldier. He runs off and disappears and does his own thing. Normally, you find him in an Irish bar somewhere. Being there's no Irish bar here, he's just decided to go off on his own anyway. And last time we saw him, he was heading over there. So, um, oh, there he is. Where is he? Right, right in front of us. Oh, he's come back. <laughs> there you are. I was just telling you, you went off on your own. Yes, there he is. He's back. Boys and girls couldn't find the Irish pub, so he came back. That's why. Yanni is is the jester. He's so funny. He's a party animal as well. Out he goes, strutting around, and uh, he enjoys he enjoys his life very much. Yanni is someone I can bounce a lot of stuff off. And you know, we could talk for hours about the band, about music. He's a talented guy. You know. Probably won't tell you. He's got a degree in like sociology. He's a very educated guy. It's two sides of Yanni. Yanni can be quite sort of outgoing at times. He loves going to Irish bars and mixing with people and, and other times he'll go out strutting like now. He'll probably out be, be out strutting today on his own somewhere. It's a free spirit. He plays guitar like a free spirit. He never plays the same thing twice. Which, you know, sometimes the other guys are looking over going, what the f are you doing? Okay, you know? Shall we leave this downstairs? Good luck. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, Careful, Yannick. Yeah. We've got to mind our heads here. We've got to go through a very low passageway, boys and girls. <laughs> Oi. We are under the Sun Pyramid and uh, we're probably about 50, uh, 50 feet, 60 feet into the pyramid so far. Yep. So, right, we sit down. So, <laughs> We know that the medicine tradition healers 
decide this day for you to deliver the holy fire to share it to your whole brothers on the holy wood. Take all the love to the people and that's the way how you want to heal the people. Any message you want to deliver and share it with them? I share this medicine with the spirits with my friends and wish them health, happiness, love, friendship. Cherish the spirit and the bond that we have here today. When the promoter first suggested Costa Rica, I thought he was going to do it at like 7,000 capacity hall. And he said, no, no, we're doing the football stadium. I said, you sure? He says, yeah, yeah. It ain't a doubt being the biggest gig ever in Central America. It was sold out way up front, 27,000, and anybody else they could grab me in the corner. But it was the biggest show they'd had in Costa Rica, and we'd never been there before. So it was new territory for us to kind of go in and made noise. It was like finding some weird tribe in the middle of the jungle, and they, you know, they all come out and go, Fear of the Dark, favorite album. What? Hoyos negros, mientras abre tu mente. Dios sabe que quiere ir a casa. Niños de la malicia. Children of the dead. When I was like 14 or 15, I heard Iron Maiden for the first time. Oh, this is amazing, Iron Maiden. Could you imagine to see them alive? Oh, no, shame. We live in the ass of the world. A lot of people have come here. People yeah. from El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, from South America, like Ecuador. This is once in a lifetime. I have a friend who quit his job to be here today. This is the thing, you know? This is the thing. <laughs> We 
decided to go play golf in Costa Rica. So we get out on the first tee, tee off, and get down to the first green. A fucking golf ball hit me on my wrist. Within like two minutes, it had swollen up, black and blue. And my main concern was, oh gosh, I'm not going to be out of play tonight. Oh. I'm a wounded soldier in battle. Yeah, it's, it's going to swell up a bit more. The little doc said it'll get a couple of days it will go up your arm. See, boys and girls, look, that's what a golf ball can do for you. Max Fly, number three, low compression, though. It was a shit ball, thank goodness. Dangerous game, isn't it? No, not a dangerous sure. game. You're banned. Are you all right? Thank the Lord that it wasn't an inch lower because we would have been going home. Well, it's quite ironic that with all the planning and the huge setup and all the massive logistics and everything else, the half an inch trajectory of a golf ball, and it would be Nico, of course. <laughs> <laughs> then um, it could have brought the whole thing to an end. Look at your face, you're a bit like you better be out of place. <laughs> you, better, you, better be, you better be able to play. Be... What's it going to be like in the rest of the country? Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? The show last night, phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. It's uh, 
as Bruce said when we were in Mexico, he said the further south we come down into South America, the hotter it gets. Yeah. And uh, it, it came pretty hot last night. The show was really good, and the audience were phenomenal. They did this big wave. So uh, the Colombian audience tomorrow night, you have something for live. Yeah. Nico is crazy. He's a larger than life character. You just basically send him into a room or a party or whatever, and he just batters his way through and goes schmoozing in there. And then I just walk in behind him and sort of pick up the feces. Nico is the social side of me because he's just so gregarious and fun. Him and me will go in the room, and you know, and sometimes you've got to say hello to people, it's part of it. But he's it a totally genuine, full on. And, it, and again, a great part of the team. They broke the mold when they made Nick. I mean, he's one of these people that soon, the first time you meet him, you know, you love him for life. What can you say about Nick? You know, it's best left unsaid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll do, won't it? Estamos aquí en las afueras del Parque Simón Bolívar Díaz antes del concierto de la legendaria banda de rock Iron Maiden. Como pueden ver, ya hay gente acampando, guardando puesto porque quieren estar en los mejores lugares del concierto. Coming to Colombia, we'd never been to Colombia before, and we were playing this massive park in the middle of the city, and all the way along there were tents, about three miles of it. Apparently been out there for a week, ten days, so they could get near the stage. We've never actually ever seen that before, ever. Seeing that, your pulse rate goes up and then you just get a huge adrenaline rush. Colombia was one of the places that I was slightly apprehensive about going to, I guess, because of the idea that if some kind of event kicked off off stage, that it could get nasty. Even though everybody was very happy, you got the impression that they lived with the military presence and tolerated it on a day-to-day -day basis. We've been here the whole week, but we don't have any food right now. They just take away everything, food, cameras, mm. all that stuff. So it's pretty heavy security. It's pretty heavy security. The atmosphere was charged. It was all brewing up. It was only going to take a small thing for things to potentially get out of control. The logistics, there is no fucking logistic. They are fucking assholes. Well, they don't like metal, man. They are mistreating the metal in here. The world knows that Colombia has a very uh, serious uh, social problem, but here the metal music is alive. This is the main dream for every rocker here in Colombia. I think that I'm going to cry there. I know it's very emotional, but I think that I'm going to cry there because it's a dream. I grew up listening to Iron Maiden. The old altitude is, uh, it's... You feeling it? Big difference. I woke up this morning in bed, uh, which is good, good place to wake up. But I was really out of breath, like, you're just in bed. It's like shallow breathing and stuff. Yeah. Bizarre. We've got oxygen stage right, and oxygen by the drummer! <laughs>
Oh dear, look at that. Freaking chunks and loads of like funny cheese. Oh, oh, man. Mm. <laughs> it's not bad. I'm a wuss with the cheese. I don't like the sweaty feet cheese, and I don't like the really strong cheese, but this ain't bad. Anyone bad here, Chunk of Pizza? No, no, but that's what I mean. Nine o'clock is early. Yeah, 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 true. Is that, is that, that the time we're leaving tomorrow? That's like a 7.30 wake up, isn't it? Ah, eight o'clock, mate. Pack up. You've got to do the three S's. I can do them in 15 minutes and be downstairs. I have to shave first, then the shower, then the shoe, then the shoe. I can't even say it. Did it confuse you if anything happens out of sequence? So like, it, like, it, it does sometimes. Like, like, you have to do the... Like you wipe your bum with your razor or something. No, like no, that. no, 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 no. <laughs> Brazil, for us, is where Latin America started when we did Rock in Rio. And of course, we went down there just for one show, and the experience was unbelievable, life-changing. The Rock in Rio in 85 was fantastic. We flew in specially for one show, about 300,000 people, and it was being televised live throughout South America. And the whole of South America suddenly went maiden. We came from upstate New York, it was freezing cold. Went down to Rio, I don't think I'd ever really been to a hot country before. <laughs> Certainly not South America, it was all, you know, wide-eyed. It was all a bit of a shock, really. They're very excitable, passionate fans and people jumping up and down, chanting Maiden and stuff like that. I mean, being British, we're not used to that. You don't get that excited. But the amazing thing is that it goes on undiminished every time we go back. You got four signs? Yeah. Are you happy? Very happy, man. Heavy metal. We're going to the iron. Very. I don't know, maybe it's my religion. In Brazil, similar to in Scandinavia, it's called the maiden religion because it means so much to so many people in those areas. But in some instances, it can actually get very exaggerated. There's a priest about an hour and a half out of San Paulo who does sermons sometimes around the morality of maiden lyrics. My name is Marcos Motolo. I have 35 years and I am a congrego in the church of Ministro for three years. And from here to the world. Eu disse que tenho 172 tatuagens da banda Iron Maiden. Eu sou fã número um do mundo, porque eu também tenho, além disso, um fã clube chamado Pais of Maiden. E o meu filho chama Steve Harris. Eu ouvi falar em documentários na época de The Number of the Beast. Aquela época era uma visão da igreja em 1983. Hoje é a visão da igreja em 2008. E a igreja ela abriu um pouco bilateralmente para que possa entender entre cultura e espiritualidade. Could you describe for us uh, some of your tattoos? Paz of Maide, amarrada no 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 bico. Conforme a gente mexe, ele tenta se escapar.
crazy. With the success of the band in South America, you do get the corollary, the price of fame, which is that you really just stuck inside the hotel. You can't just go and amble out and take a stroll. Argentina was just a bit less subtle. It was just 24-7. The fans do get a bit much sometimes when you've been traveling all day and people expect you to stop and sign and have photos and look all cheerful. And the way I look at it is once you're in a hotel, that's my home away from home. Outside the hotel, we're fair game. <laughs> Is five to one in the afternoon. Hey, 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 hey. 
la llegada de Maiden significa la resurrección del metal en Chile. Todavía no pisaban suelo nacional y ya habían desatado la locura. Increíble, espectacular. ¡Grande Maiden, grande! Que Maiden son los dioses del metal, son los dioses. El piloto nada menos que Bruce Dickinson, el vocalista de la banda, bastó que estacionara la nave para que adentro el caos se tomara el aeropuerto. This was the most out of control reception that I think we've had in Chile. And it's, it's kind of ironic that we're in that situation now because we were banned uh, initially. Tienen claras tendencias satánicas, por lo que no es bueno su presentación aquí en Chile. The once all powerful Catholic Church took exception to what they thought were our satanic lyrics. And unbelievably, they stopped us coming to Chile. Fue una pena muy grande porque era la primera vez que Iron Maiden iba a visitar nuestro país. El gobierno no tuviera la suficiente eh, abertura de mente para poder darse cuenta que era un solo show de rock. All they wanted to do was see the band. That was it. End of story. They didn't want to start a revolution. They just wanted to go and see a heavy metal band. essentially what would be considered a, a classic Iron Maiden set. This almost kind of like saying to the fans, okay, now we're going to give you, at least the fans in America, uh, we're going to go back and revisit the catalog. No. Not at all? No, not at all. We're not some old fossil dragging the bones of old songs around. You know? What you'll see tonight is not just a celebration of a lot of old songs, it's a celebration of a lot of young, new fans who have never seen us play these songs. <laughs> 
Anytime you go out and you play songs that you've played before, there's always going to be an, an, an element of people going, well, I've heard these songs before. But the purpose of this tour was really very, very different because our entire audience for the last eight years has been getting steadily younger. So as a big thank you, large Christmas present wrapped up in a box with a big bow on top, here, have a classic world slavery tour. Um, and that's why I get bent out of shape anytime anybody tries to play pin the tail on the donkey and the tale they're trying to pin on us is that this is some kind of revival antique show. Uh, and uh, it's not that. Is there a song or two that you most look forward to, do, to doing again that came back into the set? Tonight? Well, in general, in, yeah, or tonight, or as part of this current Somewhere Back in Time tour. Ancient Mariner. Is, is it really? Mariner, yeah, yeah, yeah. By far. <laughs> Once that plane landed in Toronto, we knew the show would go ahead and we'd achieved it, we'd done it. And that was a great feeling. And really, if you look back over six and a half weeks, we played 21 cities, 23 shows. It's equivalent of playing a major, major concert every alternate day, except those concerts are 3,000 kilometers apart. And, um, and we pulled it off. There was a sense of elation that, wow, here we are. And then I just thought, Christ, it's bloody cold.
definitely in the great white north now. I see the kids outside, outside queuing up and they're not wearing much more than I am. In the snow. Yeah, it's tough up there, man. <laughs> Looking forward to going home? Yes, I am, I must say. <laughs> Just uh, having my little bit of space. One less documentary crew to uh, contend with. <laughs> I think you guys have been pretty, uh, pretty cool, really. Yeah. Yeah, been, I was dreading it, actually. So another successful tour? Yes. Quite grueling, I would it's say. It's been amazing. <laughs> been grueling. It's been one of the hardest sort. Yeah. In terms of audience, it's been one of the best. How are you, Steve? Yeah, I'm alright. Nice show. show. <laughs> yeah. Um, we made it. Finally, we made it, yeah. <laughs> Feels like we've been out about six months sometimes, doesn't it? You yeah. know? Oh. Samuel, dear boy, you must be happy to be home on terra firma, dear boy. <laughs> Indeed I am, aye, thank aye. you. Oh. Yes. Then one more flight tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, I may be home in sunny Florida. Then I shall be getting my sticks out and going to get some lessons. I think the essence of us hasn't changed that much really as people really. I yeah. think we still do the music because we love doing the music. It's not about money, it's nice to make money, but you can see what we do is we mean it and we enjoy it. It's all about the music and I think people know that. We've done it our way, we do it without radio, we do it without basically any media. We haven't become celebrities, we still go and have a drink in the pub with our mates. Nobody has to bow down to us, you know, we're just musicians, we play music, we enjoy it. And if you like our music, God bless you. And if you don't like it, you know what? God bless you too. So it's a beautiful thing that we're still here in 2008 doing the biggest tour we've ever done. I mean, this is bigger than the 80s. I'm kind of doing something that I love doing. I've been able to play music and express myself and travel around the world and have a great life. And this is a thing you never take for granted and just enjoy every moment. We've got a bunch of uh, your fellow countrymen out with us making a, a documentary on uh, the madness that follows us around the world. So I'm putting them on fair warning now. They've been well behaved so far. They've said all the right things. They've been nice. We've even bought them drinks. But you know where they fucking live, right? That's all I'm saying. It's fitting that we should end up with the last bit of the tour that's been done around the world in this crazy, crazy schedule in a place that we love, in a place that embraced Iron Maiden before America ever knew we existed. Having gone through the gamut of so many countries and generating so much hope in people, it's starting to occur to me now that we are actually that expression being thrust onto the tip of the spear in terms of putting some kind of message out there. All people need is something to hang on to that's real. You know that somewhere in the universe is something you can rely on. They won't let you down. And if Maiden fulfill that for people, I think that would be a remarkable thing. We might all end up retiring at some point in the future having actually achieved something. <laughs> wow. <laughs>
Always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the light side of life. If life seems jolly rotten, there's something you've forgotten. And that's to laugh and smile and dance and sing. When you're feeling in the dumps, don't be silly chumps. Just purse your lips and whistle, that's the thing. Face the curtain with a bag. Forget about your seat. Give the audience a grin. Enjoy it. It's your last chance, anyhow. So always look on the bright side of death. Just before you draw your terminal breath. Life's a piece of shit. When you look at it, life's a laugh and death's a joke, it's true. You'll see it's all a show, keep them laughing as you go. Just remember that the last laugh is on you. Get Rod Smallwood in a barrel over the end of the end. <laughs> oh, it's bloody nothing, this. I've done worse.